Our readings today talk about being salt and light in the world. Hope, love, joy, peace, forgiveness, mercy and grace. These are the things that a hurting world needs. These are the wonderful gifts that we ourselves receive through Jesus. If we've benefited from these, and I know I wouldn't stand before you here today without them, then how come it is that we don't so easily share them? We're all called to share the hope that we have in us, the message of Jesus Christ and of his love and his forgiveness. Some of us find it easy to do. Some of us find it hard, but we are all commanded to do it. So often we pay attention to getting it right. What we need to say rather than focusing on how we say it. Today's readings talk about the need for us to be salty, to be effective, to be beacons pointing toward Jesus. And our Colossians reading tells us how to do that. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always, always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone and how to live before everyone. Unfortunately, when sometimes people hear the words share their faith and or evangelism or evangelist, immediately negative images can be evoked of TV and evangelists or street corner preachers or salesman type or those who you know do not practice what they preach. What a disservice they can be to God's work particularly in our Aussie culture. I know sometimes they make me want to cringe. So how would people who do not know Jesus feel? There are some of the, these are some of the people I know who've shared and represented well the gospel of Jesus. Billy Graham, John Smith, Mother Teresa, our own Alan Akers and Steve Vanderpoel. Some of us may think, well, that's not for me. I just couldn't do that. I'd stuff it up and it's not my gift. In Australia, the 2016 census says 52% of people identified themselves as Christian. The recent 2021 census says this is reduced to 43%. But still in both of them, only 15% of these people attend church on an average of once a month. We are well and truly outnumbered out there in the community. But we are out there. You are out there. And the stats show people are not going to come easily to church unless they see a need. What we do is just so foreign that we have to go to them. We have to be out among the people. We come to church because God wants us to. He wants us to be taught, to be encouraged, to be built up in our faith to be cared for by the body and to be equipped to be his out in the world, on the front line where he has placed us. Every day we touch the lives of all we come into contact with, as a parent, a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a friend, a colleague, a teacher or a teammate. As a church, we are out there. We have people ministering out there all the time. We have people on school councils, students and teachers in there and chaplains. A number of us work at the hospital. Matt and Tammy and Mark are in the CFA. Graham's in the SES. Peg serves on the care van. Others volunteer at Loaves and Fishes and our aged care facilities. Some are in craft groups, sporting groups, choirs and men's sheds. I love doing water aerobics at the more than swimming because I love the water. It keeps me exercising, but it also puts me out in the world with a whole group of other lovely, normal people. <laughs> and so often people worry that they have to do more or extra, but fail to see what they are already doing and that the opportunities are already before them. You are exactly where you need to be to serve him and our world needs God's people to make a difference where they are. Yes. <laughs> Amen. So the challenge before us is to help one another grow as disciples and encourage and pray for one another as we serve on the front lines. We need to be seeking what God is already doing 
out there. And as that song said, his goodness, he is following us. He is chasing us. He is wanting people to come to know him. So we need to be in touch with the Holy Spirit to know when and where to be that person of influence in someone's life. His spirit's already at work. We need to seek what he's doing and get on board. For if we don't, someone else will. There are plenty of other um, philosophies and theories going on in the world today that are trying to attract people under the guise of spirituality. So if we're not living it out, they're going to find other means and other ways and perhaps not the way that God would have for them. God, he sent us out to be salt and light. There are 43 references to salt in the Bible and the reading about salt from Matthew follows on from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where we find a series of blessings known as the Beatitudes. And Jesus here singles out certain kinds of people who enjoy God's special favour, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted because of Jesus. And our society says, and back then it said too, that those people were losers. And yet what does Jesus say to those people? He says to them, you are the salt of the earth. You have a special mission and you are and can make a huge difference to the world around you. He uses the image of salt because of its common everyday use, where it was used mainly for two purposes. The most common being to season food, to make it tasty and pleasant to eat, and the other to preserve food. In TV cooking shows nowadays, if you don't season, you get slammed, don't you? There were no fridges or freezers in Palestine 2,000 years ago. So the way to preserve meat or fish for extended periods of time was to treat it with huge amounts of salt. Because of these two ways in salt was being used, seasoning and preservation, it was often used as a metaphor for wisdom. On the one hand, wisdom brings out the best of our knowledge and our capacity and on the other hand, listening to the voice of wisdom and acting accordingly can help preserve society and our own lives. Therefore, wisdom, they say, is like salt. And this is how also Paul understood the metaphor of salt. When he wrote to the Colossians, he reminds them to be wise. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. And this also makes sense when Jesus talks about salt losing its saltiness. Today it doesn't make sense to us because salt is pure. And pure sodium chloride, it can't lose its saltiness apparently. But in the ancient Middle East at the time of Jesus, salt was purified in the way that we know, well, not in the way that we know, but was collected from deposits left by the Dead Sea. And as it dried, the salt was exposed to the elements and could break apart and lose its flavour. The word that Jesus uses for losing its saltiness literally means being or becoming silly or foolish. So Jesus is saying this, the world may think that you're pitiful losers or the scum of the earth, and they may trample on you to make their point but I say to you, you bring taste and wisdom to the world that they don't have. Give them something to look at. Give them something to want. Unfortunately, many Christians don't live like salt of the earth. In the eyes of their non-Christian neighbours and colleagues, they are tasteless or even distasteful. Or worse, they show no difference at all. How salty are you? How do those around you see you? Our saltiness needs to be visible in our ordinary day-to-day -day activities, in the way we treat a shop, assistants, a shop assistant, in the way we order a meal in a restaurant, in the way we treat our employees, in the way we drive a car. Jesus did not say you're the light of the church. He said you're the light of the world. 
And this is how the gospel spread initially. The followers of Jesus live so radically and so noticeably different and, and with such justice and love and by so doing benefited those who lived around them, that their numbers grew and grew and grew and the church spread. Salt also has healing properties. Salt water will draw out infection, clean a wound, a hot bath sprinkled with Epsom salts relieves aches and pains. So we can take that healing out into our world. And salt creates thirst. In 1965, the soft drink company Pepsi-Cola also purchased a potato chip company called Frito-Lay. Why would a soft drink company buy a potato chip company? Potato chips make you thirsty. Why do potato chips make you thirsty? Because they're salty. Salt makes you thirsty. And if we are living Christ-like lives, we'll make others thirst for Jesus too for that living water. This is what happened to the Samaritan woman at the well. Give me this water so that I will thirst no more. What do you do with a man who's supposed to be the holiest man who has ever lived and yet goes around talking with prostitutes and hugging lepers? What do you do with a man who not only mingles with the most unsavoury people, but actually enjoys being with them. The religious accused Jesus of being a drunkard, a glutton and having a tacky taste in friends. It's a profound irony that the Son of God visited the planet and one of the chief complaints against him was that he was not religious enough. He was the holiest man that ever lived, adored by outcasts and thieves, and yet he was the, it was the religious who hated him. Rebecca Manley Pippet wrote Out of the Salt Shaker many years ago, and I read it when I was working at Scripture Union in my early 20s, and it has had a profound effect and influence on how I view myself and my call to evangelism, and it still does today. She says, our problem in evangelism in being salty is not that we don't have enough information, it is that we don't know how to be ourselves. We forget we're called to be witnesses to what we have seen and what we know, because no one can dispute that, not to what we don't know. The key on our part is authenticity and obedience, not a doctorate in theology. We haven't grasped that it really is okay for us to be who we are, who God created us to be when we are with seekers. Even if we don't have all the answers to their questions or if our knowledge of scripture is limited. All too often the problem stems from our great difficulty in believing that God is glorified in our utter humanity, in just doing life rather than in spiritually programmed responses. The world is crying out for people to be real and this is holiness at work anytime and anywhere. Paul's mind is obviously always on sharing the gospel, sharing Christ with the world and he reminds us that sharing Christ is everyone's responsibility. In Mark, Jesus tells us to be salty and to live in peace and in Colossians, Paul outlines a three-point plan on how to be salty. Now, I usually don't like three-point plans or programs, but this one I, I, I quite liked. It's very practical. He says to be wise. Paul starts off his battle plan for evangelism by saying, live wisely among those who aren't believers. Often living wisely simply means that we need to remember that those who don't know Christ are watching us. Paul tells us to make sure our speech is gracious and attractive. You know, to, I'd have heard the phrase, worth your salt. It was seen as something of great value. Is that how our words are seen? Not by us, but by those who hear them or overhear them. Remember when your mother used to tell you, if you can't say anything nice, then don't say anything at all. Not bad advice. 
There was a man who was in a real rush to get to an, an important meeting, but as he was speeding through town, he got stuck behind a slow-moving truck. I hope n none of you can relate to this, but when the truck, dri truck driver stopped at a red light, he tooted the horn crazily and leaned out the window screaming at him for not travelling faster and thus having to stop at the red light. Still in mid-rant, he heard footsteps and looked up to see a very serious-looking police officer. The officer ordered him to exit his car with his hands up, took him to the police station where he was searched, fingerprinted and put in a jail cell just for yelling at someone. After a few hours, he was all escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer apologised. He said, I'm so sorry for the mistake. You see, I pulled up behind you and saw you honking and swearing at the man in front of you. And then I saw your What Would Jesus Do sticker um, and licence plate holder and I love your My Church bumper sticker. So naturally I assumed that you'd stolen the car. Furthermore, Paul calls, urges us to be watchful about our witnessing. In the second half of this verse, Paul says, make the most of your opportunities. And it's an interesting fra phrase. It's actually a commercial term and it means to buy up. So buy up all those opportunities. This phrase was often used to describe someone finding a really good bargain on sale and buying all they could afford because the price was so good. This would mean that we're buying opportunities in advance. They will be waiting there for us. In so doing, they make, make the most of their opportunity. Of course, Paul doesn't have shopping in mind, but he does want us to make the most of our interactions with unbelievers. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and with respect. Be wise, be watchful. And finally, Paul instructs us to be winsome. It's a weird word. We don't use it often today, but it was W for you and it fitted. <laughs> today, there are many different ways of reaching people. Social media can be a great influencer, both in good and bad ways. Larry Wilson, the pastor of Falls Creek, Fall Creek Wesleyan Church, recently posted a blog, eight social media mistakes you need to stop making right now. And in it, he writes, advocate any position you truly believe in, but please do so kindly and with no attempt to humiliate, to crush, to demolish, to wreck or reduce to a puddle of tears the people who disagree with you. Say something nice or it's at least say it in a nice way. And we know social media can be so damaging so easily um, to people today. And so often Christians do get on there to make their case, but don't do it nicely or kindly. Words are words and they need to be spoken with grace and seasoned with salt, regardless of whether you speak them, write them, post them or tweet them. Very few people have ever been argued into Christianity and probably fewer still have been embraced, have embraced Christ because of a rant that they've read on Facebook about their lifestyle posted by some nasty Christian. When we're filled with self-righteousness or criticism, people feel judgment and not hope. They feel condemned and not welcome. Paul says when you talk, you should always be kind and pleasant so you'll be able to answer everyone the way you should. Instead of kind and pleasant, the New Living Translation says gracious and attractive, and the older translations say let your speech always be seasoned with salt. We need to be more like Jesus, who is the perfect embodiment of both truth and grace. Even when he dealt with sin, he did it gently and spoke words of grace. The Bible says after listening to Jesus teach, everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips, even though he was from Nazareth. Nobody walked away from Jesus thinking, that guy's a jerk. And I hope they don't walk away from you thinking that either. I, 
I met someone re- oh, a while ago, actually, sorry, who um, at his work he used to complain about being persecuted. But really, he was just an idiot. <laughs> like, he, he claimed persecution for his faith, where really, yeah, he, yeah, anyway. So we need to think about how we live. We don't want to be persecuted because we're an idiot. We want to be persecuted because we're living the faithful life that Jesus has called us to. I've recently been watching The Chosen. Has anyone here seen The Chosen? Yeah. A series about the disciples who follow Jesus. Series one's on Netflix and then you can actually get an app and watch them all. I mean, I've watched lots of series, you know, things about Jesus, obviously films over the years, but I really love this portrayal of him. It is so different to other films I've seen. You see him just ooze love and enjoyment of other people. The way he interacts and has fun and plays with them, yet living, you know, a wonderful life. It's just a beautiful, beautiful portrayal of him, a real portrayal and and one that makes you want to be with him. So um, you see Jesus having fun and a laugh with the disciples as he interacts with them. The way they interwove all the stories are fantastic Everyone wants to associate with him, especially those who don't have a place in the community. So for me, it's really been encouraging to see, um, yeah, a different light and look at him in a different light. So if you haven't seen it, I would really encourage you to do it. And it's very uh, faithful to to the word too. Salt brings flavour. We're to add flavour to our world. We too are to have fun with people, to enjoy people. If people don't see us doing that, why would they want to follow us, you know? Too many followers of Christ walk around as though that they'd just lost their best friend. Too often the church is seen as a place for joyless people. We're to maintain our distinctive when we're in contact with the world. And what are you doing to be a preservative? How are you showing enjoyment of life to those around you? What are you doing to bring pizzazz to it? Can I say, stay salty, stay close to Jesus and season your witness. Be wise, make sure your character matches your creed. You know, walk the walk, walk the talk. Be watchful, take advantage of opportunities to share the hope of Christ that you have in you. Be alert to it, look for it. He, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the opportunities because he wants people to come to know him. Be winsome, be pleasant and polite. Share your faith with a smile. Crazy, perhaps, but not weird, not not idiotic. (laughs) Be real. Think about the people who made a difference in your life. Think about the people who influenced you to want to come to know Jesus and try and emulate and live as they would. But mostly stay your focus on Jesus who shows us how to live, how to love and how to offer the world that grace and peace and mercy and love that our hurting world needs. Let's pray. (coughs) Oh, Lord God, we thank you so much that you want people to come to know you, that we are created for relationship. We are created to have a relationship with the living the most high and most holy God. Thank you. Thank you that you sent your son to open the way for us to do that. Thank you for how he lived, for how he showed us to live, for how he enjoyed people, for how he enjoyed life, for how he interacted with people and met them right where they were at, how he treated each of them so differently because he knew each of them so intimately. Oh, Lord God, may we be genuine to who God has created us to be so as the world can see people who are real and who are authentic, who are enjoying life, so as they too might be attracted to how it is we live and to who we follow. God, keep us salty. Keep us close to you. Keep us in fellowship with one another. 
and keep us uh, mindful to be kind, to be real and to be loving to all that we meet. Through your Holy Spirit, give us the strength, the wisdom and the power to do that honestly, genuinely and authentically. We want to represent you well. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.